He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Four times in the Gospels, Jesus utters this statement. And then seven times in Revelation, Jesus is recorded as saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, there are warnings throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, about listening to God, about hearing from God, about paying attention to what God says when he says it so that we do not miss out. Now, of course, none of us need to worry about that, right? Because we're the people of God. We're in his house. We're tuned in on, you know, from our homes, watching worship, being a part of worship. And, and so we don't have to, you know, worry about that, right? Except that, all the times that Jesus spoke those warnings, all the times they're given in Scripture, it is to the people of God. It is to the churches of Jesus Christ. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So today, do you want to hear from God? Okay, about a third of the group does. Not sure what the rest of you are here for. We just like the music. Could you hurry up and get done preaching so they can come back out? Hey, do you guys want to hear from God? Yes. All right, well, I'm glad that you want to hear from God. If you do, then and take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Isaiah 55. Uh, if uh, you don't have a Bible with you, that's perfectly fine. If you're at Sweetwater Campus, then grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker Campus, then there's a table back in the middle. Just run back there real quick right now. Grab a Bible. That's perfectly fine. And turn to page 731, and you'll be able to find our text and follow along with us in Isaiah 55. And as always, if you are joining us and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Um, Isaiah 55, God is speaking through the prophet and he has something to say to us, to all of us. So he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It begins with the invitation to come. The invitation to come, Isaiah 55, verse one. God says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come. God invites us to come to him and be blessed. And, and I don't know if you noticed this, God invites, it's the second word that is in the text, Come, everyone. God invites everyone to come and be blessed. Isn't that amazing? That means that God is inviting us. God is inviting you. Just, just let that sink in. Obviously, that doesn't uh, kind of resonate with you the same way it does with me, because I think this is one of the most incredible truths that any of us can ever encounter, that the living God wants us. See, for me, this is just absolute joy. I'm invited, I'm included, I'm welcomed, and I'm wanted by God. See, um, when I was growing up, I moved a lot. Okay, I mean a lot. How many of you moved a lot when you were growing up? Okay, I see those hands. I'm, I'm glad you, you can feel my pain. So we can get together afterwards and compare who moved more. So here's, here's my story. Four states, nine cities, 15 houses in the first 18 years. Yeah, see, some of you are like, okay, I didn't move a lot. Some of you are like, that's nothing. I want to hear your story. And see, people always ask me when I tell them that, oh, were your parents military? And I said, no, just crazy. <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't military. I made up a story. I was like, hey, you know, we're in witness protection, so we got to move. <laughs> Wasn't anywhere near that cool. Uh, we just were, we were always moving. And, and so since we were always moving, I was always the new kid. Always the outsider. 
So I was excluded. I didn't get invited. I was the outcast. I kind of owned that identity. Okay, that's who it is. And then God invited me. God of all creation invited me to come, to believe, to belong, to be blessed. <laughs> I think that is awesome. And here's the thing, God invites you. God wants you to come, to believe, to belong, to be blessed. It doesn't matter the failures that you've experienced. It doesn't matter the, you know, the, the rebelliousness in your heart. It doesn't matter how many people have rejected you or excluded you. You are wanted by God Almighty. That's part of the good news. Right there, come and be blessed. Did you, did you notice that? Come and, and be fed at no cost. Why would God say that? Why would he say, come and you can, you, can, you can drink all you want if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, you can come buy milk and wine, and it won't, I won't charge you for that. See, I think this is a picture of grace. It's a picture of grace that God gives us in Jesus Christ because Jesus paid for our sin. On the cross, he took all of our sin, all of our rebellion, all of our defiance, and he paid that price. And now, well, the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It, it's a gift, it's offered to us, it's free. You can't buy it, you can't afford it anyway. So Jesus provides the blessing, he provides the healing, he provides the restoration on one condition, if we come, if we come. Uh, so today, are you ready to come and receive God's grace? See, now, a lot of you are. A lot of you are here because you've already experienced God's grace, but there's some of you in this room that are, are joining us online that, that may not yet have experienced the grace of God. I mean, I mean you've, you might be coming to church all the time for years and years and years and never experienced the grace of God. You might be joining us for the very first time online uh, or drop it in because a friend convinced you to come, and, and yet you've never really experienced the grace of God. You've never really come to him, and, and right now, I'm just gonna invite you to come. I don't mean you have to stand up and walk forward or anything like that. What I mean is, right now, where you're sitting, just surrender to Jesus. You know, Scripture says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. So just surrender, just surrender. Right now, where you are, just go, okay, I give up. God, you can have me. I need you. I surrender to Jesus. He's my Lord. Okay, and he'll meet you here, and he will give you life. And, and if you're doing that right now, and you're in the room, then, you know, at the end of the service, then please find one of our prayer team members here at the front and tell them that you made that commitment. Come find one of us pastors. We'll meet at the Connection Centers. We would love to talk with you, hear your story, pray with you. And if you don't want to do that because you're just too busy, then fill out one of the connect cards that are there and just say, hey, I, I trusted Christ, I'm gonna talk to you about that. We'd love to sit down and talk to you face to face and talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus. If you're joining us online, then please let us know because we'd love to have that follow-up conversation, whether it's by phone or, or Zoom or, or whatever. We just want to be able to minister to you as well. So today, if you're ready to come and receive God's grace, you're invited to come. If you're not ready, then God wants you to hear the question. And the question is why? Continue in Isaiah 55, verse two. Because God says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. I love that question. Why are you wasting your money and your life and your time and your resources on that which doesn't satisfy? Why are you doing it? I mean, I don't know about you, but there's really only like two answers I could figure out, okay? If you're, if you're wondering why, here, here's the, the two answers I have. Maybe you come up with more. Uh, maybe you're wasting your money and your time and your energy and your resources and your life on that which doesn't satisfy because you don't realize yet it doesn't satisfy. 
I mean, maybe, you know, you're, you're still young and, and you're like buying into the world's offerings of fun and fame and success. And so you're working hard and you're playing hard and you're hoping to achieve your goals. Maybe that's degrees, maybe that's recognition, maybe that's riches. And you're just go, going for it. And, and you have yet to discover that's not gonna satisfy. Okay, and some of you right now are kind of going, yeah, I'm still not sure it's not gonna satisfy. Well, then let me share with you the... Uh, the words of wisdom from that great philosopher, Jim Carrey. <laughs> That's right. Might be the only time I ever quote Jim Carrey. But, uh, and if you're not sure who he is, then look up Ace Ventura or Dumb and Dumber. Uh, but Jim Carrey said this, and, and I think it's probably the wisest thing he ever said. I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. Isn't that amazing? As far as I know, Jim Carrey hasn't found the answer. He hasn't discovered a life-changing relationship with Jesus. He hasn't uh, declared himself a follower of Jesus, but he has declared that the, the fame, the fortune, the being able to do whatever you want isn't going to satisfy. Now, the other, you know, possible answer to why you're wasting your money, your time, your resources, your life on that which doesn't satisfy is because you've realized it doesn't satisfy, but you don't know how to get off the world's merry-go-round, so you've just been changing horses, right? You know, first it was education, and then it was, you know, job, and be successful at your job, and then it was, let's have a family, and let's have kids, and then you get older, let's have grandkids, let's retire, let's, let's do boating, RVing, off-roading, golfing, Biking? <laughs> Sorry, you guys do know that the Soldiers for Jesus are back here. This is the, <laughs> the tri-state gathering of the Soldiers for Jesus, uh, and they are a joy to have with us, and, uh, and I'm delighted. It's one of the ministries that we invest in and, and support and, and just encourage, so uh, I had to throw in the biking for them. The... Uh, And we do all this stuff, and we're still not satisfied. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? You guys know the rest, don't you? And yet loses his soul. Loses himself. It doesn't mean a thing. You see, God offers a better way. God offers a satisfying way. It's the way of grace. But to find that satisfaction, we have to come and hear the challenge. The challenge is to seek. Jump up to verse six. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. See, the challenge is to seek, and it's one that is repeated throughout Scripture. God, through Jeremiah, uh, said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. God, through the prophet Isaiah, right here, says what? Seek now. Seek the Lord while he may be found right now. So if you want to find satisfaction, if you want to find purpose, if you want to find the, the pardon, seek God. Seek the life-changing relationship with Jesus. And when we talk about that, we're not talking about just a momentary decision that you make. We're talking about a commitment that you live. Day in and day out, seek the Lord. See, seeking is active faith. You can't seek if you're not doing something to seek. Seeking is a verb. And see, a lot of us grew up not with an active faith picture in our mind, but with a real passive faith picture. You know, that was the example that was set. Don't know about you guys, I grew up in church where it's basically, hey, believe in Jesus and then don't do anything. Right? Here's all the rules, don't do this stuff. So I grew up hearing, you know, 
I don't smoke, drink, dance, or chew, or run with girls that do. Okay? I mean, you know, it was like, hey, you got to... And, and, and you took pride in all the stuff you didn't do. That's passive faith. Seeking is active faith. See, passive faith is that kind of, in case of emergency, break glass faith. It's kind of like doing life on your own until you hit a crisis and then suddenly you break out the God card and you're like, okay, I gotta play this now. Passive faith is like me with tools. <laughs> okay, if you don't know me, let me explain. I own some tools, not a lot, but I own some tools. I just hope and pray that I will never, ever have to use them. <laughs> okay, that's one of the goals in my life. And some of us are doing that with our faith. We believe in Jesus. We're just hoping that we never, ever have to trust God. Think about it. Sometimes that hits home, doesn't it? And we don't want to really have to depend on God to rescue us, to redeem us, to heal us. You see, active faith is pursuing God. It's pursuing God. How do you do that? Well, start by reading your Bible. You know, the ones that we offer to give to you? How about you pick it up and read it? I, I mean, that's, that's where it starts, right? You want to hear from God, the voice of God? Well, here it is. He wrote it down for you. All the stuff you need to know, all the things that are really crucial to life. And, and, and you can understand his will from this book. You, and if you're going to pursue God, then you need to know what he says which means you just actually have to do it day in and day out. And there are so many reading plans, Bible reading plans available online. There's, you know, you can do the old-fashioned way and pick up a daily devotion book. You can just pick up the Bible and, you know, start reading. There's all kinds of ways you can do it, but you just have to do it. You have to make time to do it. And then there's prayer. You go, well, of course we pray. Yeah, but every day, intentionally, do you make time? To, to focus on God, to sit with God and God alone. I mean, we're talking about TV off, iPad not in your hand. Not distracted by other things, but focusing on the person of Jesus with him. That's pursuing, that's seeking. And then, and then there's, of course, serving. And, and there's, you know, just the listening. You know what listening looks like? It looks like taking notes during sermons, participating in life group, asking questions, and then, of course, it's applying God's word to your life. Doesn't do you any good to learn if you don't apply. Doesn't do you any good to learn if you're not going to apply it. I mean, Jesus asked that. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Seeking God. It's active faith. So let me ask you a question. If you're going on a trip, driving someplace, or riding, to, uh, you know, Vegas, or Phoenix, or San Diego, uh, you know, Disneyland, whatever. Wait, they're already on the road at spring break. Uh, so, uh, but if you're going on a trip, uh, how many of you would rather drive? How many of you would rather be passengers? Go ahead. Okay, so we're, we're kind of split. It doesn't matter. If you're going on a trip, if you're a bad driver, I want to drive, you can ride, all right? <laughs> Actually, if, if I'm in a car, I want to drive. All right, that's just my, my predisposition. Can I just tell you that on your journey of faith, you're not gonna get very far unless you're the one driving. Your spouse is not gonna carry you to maturity. Your family is not gonna get you to seek. The preacher is not gonna be able to convince you to do it. You have to own this. You have to decide that you're gonna seek God while he may be found. Because this is the reality. Continue on verse eight. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Uh, there's two things we need to know and understand if we are followers of Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, 
and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, there are two realities that, that God wants you to hear right now. The first one is this. God thinks differently than we think. God thinks differently than you think. Did you catch that? I love verse eight. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, declares the Lord. Okay, I got that. But he goes on. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. You know what God is saying? That is a very poetic way of God telling us that we are clueless. Okay? I'm clueless, you're clueless, we're all clueless because God's ways and thoughts are so much above ours we can't even comprehend them. And yet, we have the audacity to question God. God, why did you do that? Why, what are you doing, God? Why didn't you heal this you know, child? Why didn't you rescue this person? Why did this tragedy occur? Why did my candidate lose? <laughs> Yet God is Father, and we are children. Right? You guys do realize that, right? God is Father. We, we talk about it, we say it, we pray it. Our Father, which art in heaven, right? See, a lot of times, once we grow up and we become parents, we think we're always the parent. But God's our Father. We're the children. Uh, do your preschoolers understand when you say no? Do they just clap and, and smile <laughs> when you take away the iPad? When you turn off their show? When you tell them they can't have candy for dinner? Because my two-year-old grandchildren sure don't. They love being a Grammy and Papa's, but you know what? They get unhappy when they don't get what they want. They'll cry, they'll complain, they'll, they'll say no, all that stuff. Uh, do you, does your first or second grader grasp the complexities of life? You see, you know, you think about the questions that they ask you, Right? Mommy, where do babies come from? At six years old, do you really want to go into a scientific explanation of all that? I don't think so. You're trying to figure out, hey, how do I answer this question in a way that they can understand it? How about this one? Do your teenage children respect and admire you for a curfew? <laughs> do they come to you and say, Father, I appreciate your wisdom in telling me no and that I have to be home by 10.30. You see, God is Father and we are the children and God's ways do not always make sense to us. In fact, I don't think they make sense to us at all until you put them into practice until you apply them to your life, then they begin to make sense. But honestly, let's just go ahead and admit it. Some things that God asks us to do sound absolutely crazy. They, they really do, especially if you don't know Jesus. But even if you know Jesus, you kind of want to go, seriously, you want me to do that? Because Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, how about the Apostle Paul when he says, do not take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. I don't know about that. It doesn't sound too enjoyable. Or how about the Apostle Paul when he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Oh, wait a minute. In Christ, God forgave me of, wait, how many sins did he forgive you of? All of them. So how many sins are you supposed to forgive of others? Yeah, that's a whole lot easier to answer the question in church than to do it in real life, isn't it? Some of you are going, by all does God mean exes? Yes. Or how about God talking to us through the prophet Malachi when he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. 
And if you do, I'll pour out so much a blessing that you won't be able to contain it all. And how many times have I, you know, at least from where I, I sit, I, I see people squirm and they're trying to figure out 10%. Does God really mean 10%? 10% are talking about net or gross, 10%. Is seriously about 10%? I can't give 10%. I can't afford to do that. God says, I don't know, do you trust me? You see, it, it all sounds absolutely crazy, but the world doesn't work like we think it should work. See, we think God ought to just pour out the blessings on us and then we'll give 10%, right? Because right after we win the lottery, 10%'s no problem. That's not how God works. We think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll forgive right after I, I see how God is gonna exact vengeance on them, then I'll forgive, because that, no. It's not how it works. You see, God is redeeming this world, and if we listen to his commands and we apply them to our lives, we're gonna live in God's power and God's blessings. That's reality. Second reality, God will accomplish his purpose. God will accomplish his purpose. Did you catch this, verse 11? God says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God will accomplish his purpose. Look, in the scheme of things, God created paradise. We ruined it. We rebelled and we wrecked creation and yet God continued to redeem. He paid the price for our rebellion and the sacrifice of Jesus. And one day God's going to restore. Jesus is the king of kings and he will return to make all things new, okay? That's the narrative that if you're a follower of Jesus, you believe. But did you know that right now, in this moment, God is accomplishing his purposes in this world? Even in this crazy, out of control, hate-filled, disease-ridden world, God is accomplishing his purpose right now. And by the way, God's purpose is not to protect preserve or promote you. God's purpose is not to protect, preserve, or promote your family. God's purpose is not even to promote, preserve, or protect America. Do you know what God's purpose is? It's to save people from their sins. That's the purpose of God. Jesus said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. There was all kinds of stuff going on in Jesus' day that was crazier than our day. And he said, this is why I came. This is my purpose. So here at Calvary, we describe it this way. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's why we do what we do. To lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we can watch God accomplish his purpose or we can help God accomplish his purpose. Now, God calls us his servants. So does God want us to watch or to help? This is the easiest question I'm asking all night. Does God want us to watch or to help? Okay, see again, it's easy to answer the question it's much harder to live the question. So, if we really believe that God wants us to help him accomplish his purpose, what does that look like? How do we help? Well, there's all kinds of ways you can help. You can serve on the weekends to help make all this happen. I mean, we got first impression ministry. By the way, people are starting to come back to church, so we need more volunteers anyway to, to help us do this. But we have First Impressions Ministry. We'd love for you to be one of our greeters that are welcoming people to, you know, to come back to the building if you're friendly. Okay, if you're not friendly, we got other jobs for you, okay? <laughs> Behind the scenes, away from people, okay? That's just how it works. We got more kids showing up, and so we need some help with Calvary Kids. Again, if you love children, and you can pass a background check. We'd love to, to have you work with our kids. <laughs> hey, we don't, we don't mess around about protecting our kids. You know, maybe you like playing with really fancy gadgets. Well, we got a tech team that could use your help. 
Or maybe God actually made you talented. Not, not like somebody who thinks they're talented, but not, but really made you talented, then you ought to audition for our worship team. Or maybe you're like, well, uh, uh, none of those really connect with me. Well, you know what? We're starting up a new security team. You know, email us about that. We'd love to, to sign you up and get you trained. Or, or how about uh, we're expanding our chaplain's ministry. You're gonna notice a tent out there and there's be chaplains praying for people out there. Maybe you'd like to help out with that. Or maybe you're busy on the weekends and you would say, I wanna do something during the week. Great, because our student ministry is exploding and we need people to help with junior high. Okay, again, if you like kids and you can pass a background check, uh, we could use you. We're, we're, you know, we're having around 100 kids on Thursday nights, 100 junior hires on Thursday nights in this building and, and worshiping Jesus, and, and I think we could use your help. Or, or what about if you're online? Some of you are watching online going, I gotta pass because I'm not in the building and I'm not planning on being there anytime soon because I'm far away or whatever. Hey, we need online worship hosts. So if that's something that you're interested in, you need to contact our online director and let him know that you're interested in helping out hosting a service. Or maybe you want to serve in the community. You know, blessing people in Jesus' name. You know, we've got ministries like the car show that happened this weekend. 300 plus cars and bikes and vehicles out there. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, like in teacher appreciation that we did last month to bless all the schools in, in Havasu and Parker. Or maybe it's like joining a ministry group like the, the Soldiers for Jesus and, and making a difference in a community that's really hard to reach. There's all different kinds of ways that you can be a blessing in our community, even just by going out from this place and treating people with dignity and respect all the time. Because they know who you are and they know where you worship. Most importantly, all of us can help accomplish God's purpose by inviting our unchurched friends to Calvary. Inviting our unchurched friends to Calvary. Hey, I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but it is three weeks till Easter. Three weeks, one, two, three. We'll be there. And uh, we've got these nifty invite cards. Sorry that I can't just make them magically appear in your homes. I wish I could. I could mail them to you. But um, we've got these cool invite cards. And, and here's the challenge I'm gonna make for you. Three weeks till Easter, how about if everyone invites three unchurched friends to join us for Easter worship? Three unchurched friends. By unchurched, I mean they don't have another church home, so don't go recruiting your church friends to go, hey, I gotta invite three people. They don't count. Okay, if they're already in the kingdom, they don't count. Unless they're not going to church anyplace, then you can bring them, okay? But we want unchurched people, we want you to invite your unchurched friends to come. If you're online, you go, oh, I escaped this one again. No, you didn't. You can invite people to join you two ways. Either an online watch party, three unchurched friends, convince them to come, or why don't you host them in your home and, and just the four of you guys can, you know, watch the service and then you can, you know, feed them. See how easy that is? Hey, th this is just an opportunity, an easy opportunity for you to be obedient to Jesus. And a bunch of you guys are going all over, the, you know, the rest of the West, you know, you do this at your church. You're, you're not with our cards, because that won't work for you. <laughs> okay, but, but you know, your, your own way. It, this, is, this is just simple obedience. Because God is going to accomplish his purpose. And the question is, are you gonna be a part of it? Will you be watching or serving? He who has ears to hear. Let him hear. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for a grace that does not let us go. Thank you for a, a mercy that pursues us from heaven, calls us to come and be blessed. Father, you know every one of us in, in this room that's watching online, we want to be blessed, but so often we're afraid to come. We're afraid of our past. We're afraid of our present struggles. We're afraid to, to get honest about who we are, but you forgive all our sins. So right now, let us hear your voice. Whether we need to hear the voice of affirmation and acceptance, whether we need to hear the voice of conviction and challenge, God, let us hear your voice and let us say yes so that we can live as men and women sons and daughters of the living God, making a difference in this world, joining you in accomplishing your purpose. 
That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.